Section 3 of the Watergate Report, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Final Report of the Senate Select Committee on Presidential Campaign Activities, Volume 1. Chapter 1. The Watergate Break-In and Its Prelude, Part 3. C. The Planning of Gemstone From the time that G. Gordon Liddy was appointed CRP General Counsel in December 1971, his principal efforts were devoted to developing, advocating, and implementing a comprehensive political intelligence gathering program for CRP under the codename Gemstone. The select committee's knowledge of Liddy's activities comes from sources other than Liddy himself, since he refused to testify, although instructed to do so by the committee upon the conference, pursuant to court order, of use immunity. Liddy's role in the Gemstone plan was detailed to the committee through the testimonies of James McCord, Jeb Stewart Magruder, John Dean, John Mitchell, and E. Howard Hunt although it is not clear from the testimony who originated the gemstone concept there is no dispute that it was liddy who with the aid of hunt and mccord formulated the plan and presented it for approval to dean magruder and mitchell one the meeting of january twenty seventh nineteen seventy two the first gemstone plan was presented to attorney general mitchell by Liddy at a meeting in Mitchell's Justice Department office on January 27, 1972. Magruder and Dean were also in attendance. The plan was a Liddy, Hunt, and McCord composite. McCord's input was the budget for the equipment needed to implement the electronic surveillance aspects of the plan. Hunt, still employed at the White House, aided Liddy in formulating the plans for other intelligence gathering operations. The testimony of Mitchell, Dean, and Magruder as to this meeting is fairly consistent concerning the nature of Liddy's presentation and the general contents of the plan. Liddy illustrated his presentation with six large white posters on an easel, each one portraying a specific coded component of the overall plan. The plan called for 1. The use of mugging squads and kidnapping teams to deal with leaders of anti-Nixon demonstrations. 2. Prostitutes stationed on a yacht, wired for sound, anchored offshore from Miami Beach during the Democratic Convention. 3. Electronic surveillance and break-ins at various targets, not yet identified at the time of the meeting. The budget for the plan was $1 million. Liddy's plan was not approved at the meeting. Dean testified that he was surprised at Liddy's plan and had not known of its contents prior to the meeting. He testified that Mitchell was likewise amazed and told Liddy to revise the plan, focusing on the problem of demonstrations. Magruder testified that he and Dean also indicated to Liddy that the project must be redone. According to Dean, Mitchell told him privately that Liddy's proposal was out of the question. Mitchell testified that at the January 27th meeting, he told Liddy to take the stuff out and burn it. However, Hunt testified that Liddy reported that the plan had been turned down because it was too expensive, and that he, that is Liddy, had been instructed to redraft it. McCord confirms this testimony. Despite these reactions of record by those who listened to Liddy's plan on January 27th, the fact remains that such a plan was presented in the office of the Attorney General of the United States and that Liddy, after the meeting, still held his position as CRP General Counsel, and continued to have the responsibility of developing an intelligence-gathering plan. Magruder testified that he reported the details of this meeting to Strachman, in accordance with his custom of keeping Strachman advised, on important matters so he, that is Strachman, could report to Haldeman. Strachman, however, claimed that Magruder mentioned nothing to him regarding a CRP intelligence plan until after March 30, 1972. 2. The February 4, 1972 Meeting 
On February 4th, 1972, the same group again met in the Attorney General's office and listened to Liddy present a watered-down version of his intelligence plan. This time, the plan called only for surreptitious photography and electronic surveillance. The budget for the new plan had been stripped down to $500,000. According to Magruder, Mitchell actually discussed possible targets for the new plan, including the Democratic National Committee headquarters in Washington and at the convention, and the headquarters of the Democratic nominee. Also, according to Magruder, Mitchell suggested as additional targets DNC chairman Larry O'Brien and Las Vegas publisher Hank Greenspun, who allegedly had explosive material damaging to Senator Muskie in his office safe. Liddy's proposal, Magruder testified, was not approved at the February 4th meeting, but postponed for consideration at a later time. Dean testified that, after arriving late for this meeting, he advised Liddy that such discussions should not go on in front of the Attorney General of the United States. After the meeting, Dean testified, he told Liddy that he would never again discuss the matter with him, and that, if Liddy's plan were approved, he did not want to know. Mitchell testified that he and Dean were still aghast at Liddy's proposal. Liddy apparently left the meeting believing that the basics of his plan were unobjectionable, but that his budget was still too high. Moreover, McCord testified that Liddy said, Dean had stated to Liddy that a method would have to be devised to ensure Mitchell's deniability regarding the operation, including the means by which the money would be dispersed. Magruder also testified that a discussion concerning the Attorney General's deniability took place at the February 4th meeting. Dean testified that Liddy may have misunderstood his statements concerning the impropriety of discussing the plan in front of the Attorney General and believed that Dean's only concern was with Mitchell's deniability, not with the appropriateness of the plan. Magruder testified that once again after the meeting, he reported the events to Strachman so Haldeman could be informed. This time, Magruder testified. He sent Strachman the documents Liddy had presented at the meeting, including budget sheets, and told Strachman by telephone the general content of the meeting, including the specific proposed targets for the intelligence operation. Strachman, according to Magruder, told him that any decision made by Mitchell regarding the bugging proposal was acceptable to the White House. But Strachman, during his testimony, denied receiving this information from Magruder after the February 4th meeting and claimed he had no knowledge of the Liddy plan until after March 30th, 1972. Dean testified that, Following this meeting, he met with Haldeman and told him about the meeting and the Liddy plan. He testified that he expressed his own view that the plan was incredible, unnecessary, and unwise, and that the White House should have nothing to do with it. Haldeman, according to Dean, agreed and instructed him to have no further dealings on the matter. Thus, according to both Magruder's and Dean's testimony, Haldeman knew about the Liddy intelligence plan after the February 4th meeting. Haldeman testified that he has no recollection of Dean's telling him about the February 4th meeting, but was willing to accept Dean's version of this conversation. But, on March 27, 1973, Haldeman admitted to the president that he had a meeting with Dean, during which Dean warned him about Liddy's plan and recommended that it be dropped. Moreover, Dean informed the president of his conversation with Haldeman, telling the president, Bob and I have gone over that after the fact, and he recalls my coming to the office and telling him about this crazy scheme that has been cooked up. While Dean may have felt the plan had been disapproved, Magruder did not leave the February 4th meeting with that view, since, as subsequent developments show, he continued to work with Liddy on modifying the plan, and on March 30th, 1972, presented it himself a third time to Mitchell in Key Biscayne, Florida. It is also noteworthy that, after the February 4th meeting, Liddy continued to serve as general counsel for CRP. 3. The Colson Phone Call There is evidence that Liddy believed he needed additional White House assistance to get his intelligence plan approved. 
after the february fourth meeting and before his meeting with mitchell in key biscayne on march thirtieth magruder according to his testimony received a call from charles colson special counsel to the president who told him to get on the stick and get the liddy project approved so we can get the information from o'brien hunt testified that after the february fourth meeting liddy requested an introduction to colson and that he brought liddy to colson's office hunt said he sat in the rear of the office while liddy and colson conversed and was not involved in their discussion colson made some phone calls during the conversation colson did not testify under oath before the committee but asserted his fifth amendment privilege after he was informed he was a target of the grand jury however colson had earlier submitted to a staff interview at that time colson admitted that liddy and hunt told him they could not get anyone to listen to them and that he therefore called magruder to ask him to hear their plan colson summarized this meeting with liddy and hunt in a june twentieth nineteen seventy two memorandum colson said hunt and liddy told him about elaborate proposals for security activities which they could not get approved colson said he called magruder and urged resolution of the hunt liddy proposal he stated in the memorandum that he declined hunt's offer to apprise him of the details because it was not necessary and it was of no concern to me hunt however testified that he did not offer to provide details to colson in his public testimony hunt testified that when he left colson's office after colson had made the phone calls liddy told hunt i think i may have done us some good hunt also testified it was not necessary in the march meeting to give colson details about the liddy plan he stated that in january nineteen seventy two he had informed colson he would be working on a special project with liddy that would require him to use the same cuban americans he had employed in the ellsberg break-in and that colson indicated he was aware of the comprehensive covert intelligence plan which liddy had in preparation and which had the approval of the white house hunt testified however that colson was not specifically aware that the dnc headquarters would be a target of the gemstone plan another witness to the colson call to magruder was apparently fred larue magruder testified that larue was in the room with him when he received the call and mitchell testified that larue told him that he was present when colson called larue however could not recall being present magruder's description of colson's call especially the reference to a need to get the information from o'brien provides some evidence that colson was doing more than simply being helpful to liddy and hunt dean told the president in the oval office on march twenty first nineteen seventy three that he thought colson's call to magruder helped get the thing off the dime at the same time dean told the president that strachman on haldeman's behalf was pushing magruder for intelligence information and that magruder took that as a signal to probably go to mitchell and to say they are pushing us like crazy for this from the white house four the march thirtieth nineteen seventy two meeting the third and final time liddy's intelligence plan was presented to mitchell was on march thirtieth in key biscayne florida magruder testified that he had a large number of accumulated matters including the liddy plan to submit to mitchell for his approval by this time the plan's budget had been reduced to two hundred and fifty thousand dollars prior to traveling to florida magruder testified he sent a copy of a memorandum on the pared down liddy plan to strachman for communication to haldeman magruder said this was in accordance with his practice to send key papers for discussion with mitchell to haldeman so that haldeman could comment prior to his that is magruder's meetings with mitchell strachman however denied receiving an advance copy of this memorandum magruder testified that the liddy memorandum was the last item discussed in his meeting with mitchell in key biscayne and that although no one was enthusiastic after discussing its pros and cons mitchell approved the project magruder testified that the approved two hundred and fifty thousand dollar project called for an initial entry into the democratic national committee headquarters in washington 
and at further dates, if funds were available, entries into the headquarters of the Democratic presidential contenders in Washington and at the convention in Miami. Mitchell, however, denied approving Liddy's plan. He said he told Magruder, We don't need this. I'm tired of hearing it. Let's not discuss it any further. LaRue, who was present with Mitchell and Magruder during the discussion of the various proposals Magruder presented to Mitchell, testified that, when Mitchell asked him, that is LaRue, what he thought of Liddy's plan, he replied that it was not worth the risk, and Mitchell said, well, this is not something we will have to decide on at this meeting. In a March 27, 1973 meeting between the President, Haldeman, and Ehrlichman, Haldeman reported on information CRP lawyer Paul O'Brien had received from Magruder. The final step in approving the Watergate break-in plan was when Gordon Strachman called Magruder and said Haldeman told him to get this going. The president wants it done, and there is to be no more arguing about it. This, meaning the intelligence activity, the Liddy plan. Magruder told Mitchell this, that Strachman had told him to get it going on Haldeman's orders, on the president's orders, and Mitchell signed off on it. He said, okay, if they say to do it, go ahead. Magruder did not give information of this nature to the select committee in either public or executive session. In addition, during an April 14, 1973 meeting between the president, Haldeman, and Ehrlichman, Ehrlichman stated that Magruder told him that Mitchell orally approved Liddy's third proposal, but that the approval was reluctant and that they, Mitchell and Magruder, felt bulldozed into doing it by Colson. 5. Financing the Operation when Magruder returned to Washington the following day, April 1st, he took certain actions that indicated his belief that the plan was approved. He told Robert Reznor, his administrative assistant, that Liddy's plan had been approved and asked him to notify Liddy. He called Strachman to tell him the plan was approved and informed Hugh Sloan, FCRP treasurer, that Liddy was authorized to draw $250,000 during the campaign and would probably initially need a sizable amount. Liddy quickly requested $83,000 from Sloan. Sloan testified that he first checked Liddy's request with Magruder, who told him that it was in order and to comply. Sloan became concerned because the $250,000 budget was to come from cash funds kept in a safe in his office that represented cash received prior to April 7, 1972, the effective date of the new campaign fund reporting law. Since $83,000 was totally out of line of anything we had ever done before. Sloan took the matter up to Stans, the director of FCRP. Stans told Sloan he would check with Mitchell. After meeting with Mitchell, Stans confirmed that Magruder had authority to make this kind of decision and that Sloan should pay the funds to Liddy. Responding to Sloan's concern about the purpose of such a statement, Stans, according to Sloan, said, I do not want to know, and you don't want to know. Although Stans disputed the context in which Sloan placed the remark, he agreed that it was the substance of what was said. Mitchell, however, testified that he only told Stans that Magruder had authority to pay money to Liddy and that there was no mention of substantial funds. Stans meeting with Mitchell to clear the cash payment occurred only a few days after the March 30th meeting in Key Biscayne among Mitchell, Magruder, and LaRue. 6. Transmittal of Information to Strachman Magruder testified that he completely apprised Strachman of the Liddy $250,000 plan, including the fact that its first target was the Watergate DNC headquarters. In his March 13, 1973 meeting with the president, Dean told the president that Strachman had prior knowledge of the Watergate burglary. The president immediately concluded, well then, he probably told Bob he may not have. Dean assured the president that Strachman would not testify against Haldeman. He was judicious in what he relayed, but Strachman is as tough as nails. He could go in and stonewall and say, I don't know anything about what you are talking about. He has already done it twice, you know, in interviews. 
Strachman testified that Magruder told him only that a sophisticated political intelligence gathering system had been approved with a budget of $300,000. Strachman stated that he prepared political action memorandum number 18 for Haldeman that relayed this information. Strachman said that when the memorandum was returned for filing, Haldeman had checked the item concerning this matter, indicating that he had read it. Haldeman, however, claimed he did not recall seeing such an item. Four days after the March 30th meeting in Key Biscayne, Haldeman and Mitchell met. Strachman testified he prepared a talking paper for Haldeman for the meeting that included a section respecting CRP's $300,000 intelligence plan. Haldeman testified he did not recall directing Strachman to prepare this talking paper, nor did he recall seeing such a document. Haldeman and Mitchell both testified that a CRP intelligence plan was not discussed at the April 4th meeting. Haldeman testified that his meeting with Mitchell on April 4th, 1972, was in connection with a meeting with the president and Mitchell, which covered the ITT Kleindienst hearings and a review of Mitchell's plans for assigning campaign responsibilities. They, that is his notes, indicate no discussion of intelligence. Also in April, according to Strachman, Haldeman called him into his office and told him to inform Liddy to transfer whatever intelligence capability Liddy had for Muskie to McGovern. Haldeman, Strachman said, had a particular interest in discovering what the connection between McGovern and Senator Kennedy was. Strachman said he made a note of the instruction, called Liddy to his office, and literally read the statement to him. D. Events leading to the break-in. 1. The McGovern headquarters attempts. In addition to the DNC offices at Watergate and propitious targets at the Miami convention, the Watergate conspirators hoped to bug Senator George McGovern's Washington campaign headquarters. This target appears consistent with the instruction Liddy received from Haldeman through Strachman in April to transfer whatever capability he had from Muskie to McGovern although bugging was not specifically mentioned in that instruction. McCord said he was involved in several attempts to bug McGovern's headquarters. On May 15th, McCord and Tom Gregory, a student Hunt had hired to infiltrate the McGovern campaign, walked through the McGovern headquarters in order to acquaint McCord with the office layout. Later, on the evening of May 26th, McCord and Baldwin drove to the McGovern headquarters and through the use of walkie-talkies, rendezvoused with another car occupied by Hunt, Liddy, and others. The group had planned to break into the McGovern headquarters that evening, but because of Gregory's absence and the continued presence of a man standing in front of the headquarters, the mission was canceled. The Watergate conspirators also unsuccessfully attempted to bug the McGovern headquarters on May 28th. McCord had hoped that the offices of Frank Mankiewicz and Gary Hart would be vacant so that bugging devices could be installed, but the mission this time was aborted because persons were working late inside the headquarters. And Gregory, who had been instructed by Hunt to position himself outside and report when they left, was asked by a policeman to leave the area. 2. The First Watergate Break-In Liddy and Hunt then turned to the main target of the Gemstone Plan, the Democratic National Committee headquarters in the Watergate office building. They planned the break-in for the Memorial Day weekend. Hunt alerted his Cuban-American contact in Miami, Bernard Barker, to be prepared to bring a trained burglary team to Washington. Barker, who had performed the same type of mission for Hunt in the Ellsberg matter, had also served under Hunt in the Bay of Pigs operation. He was a refugee from his native Cuba and considered himself a patriot committed to the mission of freeing Cuba from Castro. The Cuban Americans he recruited for Hunt's projects were cut from the same cloth. The motivations of Barker and his crew were clearly stated by Baker. E. Howard Hunt, under the name of Eduardo, represents to the Cuban people their liberation. I cannot deny my services in the way that it was proposed to me on a matter of national security, knowing that with my training, I had personnel available for this type of operation. I could not deny this request at that time. On May 10th or 12th, McCord and Hunt 
reconnoitered the Watergate office building by walking through it in the early evening after work, and again around 9 or 10 p.m. On May 17th, Martinez purchased six one-way tickets to Washington from Miami for Frank Carter, alias for Barker, J. Granada, alias for Reynaldo Pico, Joseph D. Alberto, alias for Sturgis, Raul Gaudi, alias for Gonzalez, Jose Piedra, alias for De Diego, and G. Valdez, alias for Martinez. On May 22nd, the Miamians registered at the Manger Hamilton Hotel in Washington, and on May 26th, moved to the Watergate Hotel, where they stayed until May 30th. Barker testified that he met with Hunt at the Manger Hamilton Hotel shortly after his arrival in Washington, and Hunt explained to him the general nature of the mission. Barker, however, did not relay the nature of the assignment to his team until just before entry into the DNC headquarters. At that time, the different tasks of the participants were discussed. By the early morning hours of May 28th, the Watergate conspirators, after two frustrated attempts, completed their first break-in of the DNC. The entry was made late on May 27th, when Gonzalez picked the lock of the ground floor door of the Watergate office building. The burglary team then went to the sixth floor offices of the DNC headquarters. McCord placed electronic bugging devices, miniature transmitters, in the telephones of the DNC chairman, Larry O'Brien, and another official, Spencer Oliver, and Barker and his team photographed papers from DNC files. 3. The Fruits of the First Break-In After the DNC telephones were tapped, Alfred Baldwin, a former FBI agent recruited by McCord, monitored intercepted telephone conversations from a room in the Howard Johnson Motor Lodge across the street from the Watergate office building. He typed the conversations almost verbatim and gave the logs to McCord. McCord gave the logs to Liddy, who had several retyped by his secretary, Sally Harmon. Liddy told McCord he wanted them in final form before his discussions with Mitchell and other recipients of the logs. The Gemstone Project had its own stationery with the word, Gemstone, printed in large letters at the top. Sally Harmon testified she used Gemstone stationery when she retyped the telephone logs. Harmon also said she saw a stack of 8 by 10 inch photographs of documents from the DNC headquarters held by fingers in rubber gloves. Ms. Harmon testified that she began to type certain general intelligence memorandums for Liddy in April that led her to believe that CRP had infiltrated the headquarters of McGovern and Muskie. In keeping with the spy motif that characterized Liddy's operations, code names referring to information sources were used in the intelligence memorandums. The three code names she could recall were Ruby 1, Ruby 2, and Crystal. Magruder testified that, after Liddy's project was approved, he did not hear from Liddy until after May 27th, when Liddy reported the DNC break-in and installation of the telephone tapping devices. Magruder said he reported the May 27th entry to Strachman, but at that time gave Strachman no further details. After the May 27th DNC break-in, Magruder received from Liddy two installments of documents embodying the fruits of the break-in. The installments included summaries of phone conversations on gemstone stationery and photographs of documents. Magruder testified he showed these gemstone materials to Mitchell in a regular 8.30 morning meeting with him in his office in either CRP headquarters or his law firm, which was located in the same building. According to Magruder's testimony, Mitchell found the documents of no use and called Liddy to his office and told him the materials he received were not satisfactory and was not worth the money that he had paid for it. Magruder said Liddy explained there was a technical difficulty with one wiretap and that one had been improperly placed. Liddy said he would correct these matters and hopefully obtain useful information. Mitchell denied receiving any gemstone material or informing Liddy that he was unhappy with the intelligence information. In fact, Mitchell testified that he did not see nor talk with Liddy between February 4, 1972 and June 15, 1972. However, Magruder's administrative assistant, Robert Reisner, 
testified that several weeks prior to June 17, 1972, Magruder handed him materials on stationery bearing the letterhead, Gemstone, for the purpose of preparing a file for Mr. Mitchell for a meeting between Mitchell and Magruder. Reisner also testified that, on another occasion, he saw Gemstone stationery and envelopes and photographs or what appeared to be photographs with the stationery. Mr. Reisner identified committee exhibits 16 and 18, which are copies of gemstone stationery and the envelope for gemstone materials, as being the same type stationery and envelopes he saw in Magruder's office and used to prepare Mr. Mitchell's file. The gemstone envelopes bore the words, sensitive material, in large red capital letters, and the words, handle as code word material, in smaller letters. In the lower left-hand corner of the envelope were printed the abbreviated words X dis, followed by no dism. These abbreviations apparently stood for executive distribution and no dissemination. Also at the bottom of the gemstone stationery were the printed words, warning, this information is for intelligence purposes only. Exploitation may compromise source and terminate flow of information. Magruder also testified that he showed Strachman the gemstone documents he received from Liddy. He said that, because of their sensitive nature, he had Strachman view them in Magruder's office. He and Strachman, Magruder said, agreed there was no substance to the documents. Strachman denied that Magruder showed him wiretap reports or gemstone documents and said he never heard the term gemstone prior to June 17, 1972. Haldeman stated in a staff interview that Strachman never reported to him that he had seen a gemstone file. 4. Factors Leading to the Second Break-In The second Watergate break-in was apparently made to correct the difficulty experienced with the wiretap device on Mr. O'Brien's telephone. Dean testified that on June 19, 1972, two days after the June 17th break-in, he met with Liddy who told him that the men arrested in the DNC were his men. When Dean asked Liddy why he had been in the DNC, he told Dean that Magruder had pushed him into doing it. He told me he had not wanted to do it, but Magruder had complained about the fact that they were not getting good information from a bug they had placed in the DNC earlier. He then explained something about the steel structure of the Watergate office building that was inhibiting transmission of the bug and that they had gone into the building to correct this problem. Dean later gave this same account to President Nixon on March 21, 1973. But Ehrlichman, during a meeting with the President and Haldeman on April 14, 1973, said Magruder told him that the second DNC break-in was Liddy's own notion and that neither Mitchell nor Magruder knew that another break-in was contemplated. Ehrlichman said Magruder told him that Liddy had met with Mitchell and, referencing the difficulties experienced, had only said, Mr. Mitchell, I'll take care of it. McCord testified that Liddy had told him a second break-in was necessary because Mitchell wanted a second photographic operation and that, in addition, as long as that team was going in, that Mr. Mitchell wanted Mr. Liddy to check the malfunctioning of the second device that was put in and see what the problem was because it was one of two things, either a malfunction of the equipment or the fact that the installation of the device was in a room which was surrounded by four walls. In other words, it was shielded and he wanted this corrected and another device installed. In any event, it appears that the second DNC break-in in the early morning hours of June 17th was carried out with a sense of urgency by Liddy and without the planning engaged in for the first successful break-in. The urgency of the second break-in is emphasized by the fact that the burglars decided to proceed with the operation, even though McCord found that the tape initially placed on the garage door leading to the stairwell had been removed, making it necessary to pick the lock again. The risk of discovery was obvious to all the break-in team, yet after hurried consultation with Liddy in the Watergate Hotel, the decision was made to continue. A second piece of tape was placed on the basement garage door, an action that was the burglar's undoing, for it was the Watergate guard, Frank Wills, who had found the first piece of tape and removed it, 
thinking that one of the engineers for the building had put it on the door. When he made his rounds again and saw the door re-taped, he telephoned the police. Within minutes, Sergeant Leeper's plainclothes squad arrived at the Watergate office building, searched the stairwell, and entered the sixth-floor offices of the Democratic National Committee headquarters. When Officer Barrett discovered the burglars and yelled, Hold it! Come out! The break-in team was apprehended in the midst of setting up photographic equipment. The next afternoon, Leeper obtained search warrants for the rooms which the burglars had occupied. Their police found $4,200 in $100 bills, all with serial numbers in sequence, more electronic equipment, sets of blue surgical gloves, and a small notebook containing the name E. Howard Hunt. The burglary was over, but the Watergate scandal had just begun. End of section 3